this session is going to be all about um, discussing um, how, as developers, we look at product quality. Um, why I talk about product rather than software quality will come uh, apparent a bit later. When I talk about product from our mindset, you can take that to mean Debian or individual packages that you may maintain. Um, but we're looking at product as opposed to necessarily software quality, so it's not necessarily all about the code. Um, uh, this is all based around a, a large pan-European uh, research project that's going on right now. So all I'm going to do is spend a little bit of time just introducing the work of that project, what it's all about, um, the kind of things that we're trying to introduce into free software quality assessment, and then um, uh, basically there's a, there's a few questions I want to put to you know Debian package maintainers as, as, as a whole to see what you guys think about when when you think about quality, when you're evaluating your own packages, or what you think about quality when you evaluate Debian as a whole. Uh, so I've got a few questions which will be sort of based on on the talk. Um, uh, so the talk's really just kind of food for thought. Um, I'm, it's, it's actually based on one that I'm giving at Academy in a few weeks' time, so I'm going to cut that short, keep it up to like 10-15 minutes. Um, and then it's it's really open to discussion from that point. Um, it really is all about sort of best practice sharing and stuff like that. Um, Feel free to cut me off at any point and ask questions. It's a it's a discussion really. It's a off. It's not a it's not a talk. Have a slide somewhere? Yeah, I'll um, the slides aren't public yet, um, but I'll I'll make them public um, immediately after the talk, and I'll I'll give people the URL where they can. But if, if you could just copy them now, some of the space would be delayed because then we could just look at look the at slides. Them. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> That happens if you're uh, giving a talk with geeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Repeat the feed solutions. <laughs> Is anyone else having DNS problems today? Yeah. Yes. Sometimes the DHCP seems to. I, I can't talk to my web server, so I'll, I'll try again later. I can. Like, you can, you can do it in a, I can look at uh, this up for you. It's probably just not. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I just want to get on with it. It's dark. The, the presentation is not important. It's, okay. it's, it's the basis for what I'm going to be giving to the KDE developers in a few weeks. It's, this really is a discussion. It's not a. Uh, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll post them afterwards and I'll let people know what I'm going to do. Uh, okay, so um, in my day-to-day -day work, I'm a, a free software researcher. I've been for a few years now working on uh, generally sort of large pan-European projects. And uh, today, the, the sort of feed point for this discussion is, is one of those. Um, um, it's a project uh, called Squash, unfortunately. It's the um, Software Quality Observatory for Open Source Software. And we're building a platform to evaluate quality based on as much public data as we can get our hands on. So, um, whereas in the past people have focused on um, their code primarily, um, and they've run you know, simple metrics based on slot count and, and things like that, 
um, what we now want to bring into the equation is basically anything else we can get our hands on. So by looking at mailing lists, how can we see how discussion affects the quality of the final product? Um, how can we see uh, from some of the metadata that's going on in some version, CVS kit, whatever, um, how, how what goes on inside there affects the, the final quality of the product. So it's basically, it's looking at new ways of evaluating quality based on all the public data that's available. Um, not, just the, not just the things that are sort of commonly looked at, um, like, uh, you know, just the code. Um, and the reason <coughs> particularly that um, as a project we were, we were keen to uh, engage with Debian is because um, Basically, a bit because of the the packaging, um, because you guys as developers are not so focused on the code in terms of development, but you are in terms of maintenance. So, what we're looking at is how um, Debian, in that respect, differs from you know the actual upstream development projects um, in terms of how the final system might actually be used, what you might be used for, in terms of what you're actually interested in as package maintainers when you think about what makes something a good quality package. Um, so the problem we're posed with this is that quality is sort of completely subjective. Um, you know what I what I think of as um, you know, good quality code, just a good quality final product is not necessarily what, you know, you guys all might think. And so, um, we're posed in a situation here where when we do try to evaluate quality, we are, uh, we're left in a situation where we are forced to create our own um, guidelines, our own starting point. So, you know, for instance, within Debian, we do have guidelines as to, you know, bare minimum quality builds for the packages. Um, certain projects have actual processes that they expect you to go through when you're submitting code and stuff like that. Um, and those end up being like our, like our quality definition, in effect. There are, there are end point. That's the thing we're ultimately trying to uh, see if we can measure it in some manner. And so what we're trying to do is build a system which is, uh, allows us to actually just automate all of that. So it's, the idea is it's going to be a, a plug-in based number cruncher, quite frankly. The idea being is all of these concepts, all of the things that you consider to be contributors to quality, the idea of what we're trying to do in this research project is to, well first off, in sessions like this, get an idea of what those things are, and then look at ways of actually evaluating them. So having tools which run metrics against code is common practice and is easy, quite frankly. And building plugins for them for our final system will be, you know, trivial to be honest. However, when people start talking about things like, oh, actually, I could see how the ratio between the size of a package and the number of maintainers might have some kind of that might have some kind of bearing on quality, or it might be the, the turnover of maintainership. Like, how many times has this package changed maintainership in the last since forever? Um, all of these things are, they become slightly, um, they become slightly harder to measure if we, you know, for instance, if the, if the public data about that is in, you know, some kind of unstructured form, you know, we then have to start writing quite complex tools in order to gather that data to then actually, you know, run it against the rest of the, the code or whatever, part of the quality model to see how it actually contributes to quality. So, um, those are the things that I'm um, particularly interested in, um, uh, in in focusing on in this discussion. When we kind of when I finish talking, we start talking more generally as a, as a discussion. Um, I'm going to introduce one, just as a, an example of kind of things that might affect quality that you might not have thought about. Um, You'll have to forgive me, this is where kind of the maths is going to kick in, so um, please, when I, once I've posted the URL, go and find the slide and the maths will be there in front of you. Um, but something I've been looking at, um, like in my own particular part of this project, is, is looking at how a project manages to engage its developers over time. Um, the reason for that is in um, my general area of interest is looking at, my specific area of interest, Rather, so is looking at agility. 
So is there a relationship between how agile a development process is and the resultant effect on quality? So that's specifically why I'm looking at. So um, as an example of the kind of things that people don't necessarily think about, uh, I want to introduce something called uh, mean developer engagement. So this is a measurement of how well uh, a developer is used over time by the project. Uh, is the project making the most out of its developer resources? Um, the, the free software projects, you know, they're, they're all in competition for developers and users. Um, it's just kind of, you know, it's a fact of our ecosystem. So being able to engage developers is really important because quite often their former users have become developers or they're hopefully the other way around, they're people who have skills that you want to attract into your project and I hope that they'll become end users as well. So it's quite an important measurement. So I won't talk through the maths, um, but I'll show you the result of it. So this, this thing called mean developer engagement, basically if all of your developers are used all the time, you'll average a score of one and it'll you'll get a nice if you graph this, this metric over time, you'll get a straight line across of 100% uh, utilization. But that never happens, uh, especially early on in projects um, where someone starts it up and says, oh, I quite like this, it's, it's my personal you know, itch which needs scratching, and then someone else comes along and joins them, and there's tension and friction, and one guy drops out, and another guy takes it. All sorts of things tend to go on at the very beginning of projects. So I'm afraid this is huddled around the screen time, just to, to show you what's going on. So what I've got here, as I've got the red line, is this metric, is the mean developer engagement. So how well has the project managed to engage its developers over time? Uh, as a reference point, um, which I'll show on the next slide why it's important. <laughs> <That's not laughs> the, um, the green line here um, is, is the actual number of developers in the code base. Um, so basically what this is showing us is that, so this is for, this is for the entirety of, of uh, Subversion for KDE. Uh, so we're talking about 1,600 developers and it's a 50 gigabyte repository. Um, uh, what we'll see here, and as I said earlier on, quite often is here you'll, you'll have an anomaly early on in the project, which is it's almost all projects have it. I've, I've actually yet to find one which won't. And it's basically caused by um, turmoil early on in the project. Someone starts up and then thinks, you know, oh, actually, I can't do this, and then someone takes over. That, that type of thing happens, and it seems to happen early on in projects. So uh, that's the kind of thing we're getting. They're also almost always asymptotic to some level as well. So for KDE, it's, it's just below 30% utilization uh, of their developers over time. Now, the problem with this in, in its current form, so what we're measuring here is the number of active developers over the total number of developers over time. That's effectively what this is, you know, it's a simple metric that's been graphed here. Um, part of the problem is understanding where, um, when someone actually drops out of a project. So when you're calculating the total number of developers in a project based purely on some version Git, CBS, whatever, it's actually hard to detect when someone actually drops out because if they've been inactive for five weeks, there's nothing to say they won't reappear in week six. Um, I've, I'm currently looking for ways to get around that. I mean, there are ways of getting around that. But this is a very rudimentary where we basically say, if you're in some version, you're in the project. So you know, the total number of developers only ever goes up uh, in this particular scenario. As a result, these figures are slightly lower than what you'd actually expect. You'd expect the development engagement to be slightly higher because I'm taking into account here developers who have actually. So, I mean, the things to note here are the actual slope, so how quickly does it drop off, um, and uh, to what level it drops off. Um, and to give you a good example, let's hold around the screen time again. Um, here's the same for events. Okay, so we've gone from KE, which is obviously a very large project, to events, which is just, you know, a small subset of, of known. But what we've got here, the reason I chose this is because of how dramatically difficult, uh, different it is, is it drops off very quickly, and there's a lot of friction early on. And then it's asymptotic to actually a very low level. It's, you know, it, 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 it's sort of 2% developer engagement. Um, and so, as quality evaluators, if we're able to see this kind of thing over time, and know that 
as events, hey, I'm pulling in a meet developer engagement of 2%, but KDE can bring in 30%, 40%. Um, there's probably something we should look at as a product developer as to how we should better engage our developers to, to make the most of what is, you know, in effect, a very scarce resource. Now, the interesting thing here is uh, around about week, uh, yeah, 300, um, the number of, you know, the size of the MDE actually grows. Um, now, over time, to get MDE to actually go up, like I said, it's, it's asymptotic to some level, to actually get it to go up again needs something pretty extreme to happen uh, in, the, in the developer community. In this case, you can see the green line, and then it shoots off through the top of the graph. Now, actually, when you compare this to the previous one, the scales are different. So, actually, the growth of developers here is actually still uh, not as good as the, you know, the growth of developers in the KDE project. Um, but in comparison to how it was, I mean, they, they, this is an extraordinary uh, developer growth. And the reason that happened was uh, events sat in the, the known repository doing nothing for about six years. Um, and what happened here, this is, this is, you know, it's been in development for 300 weeks. And it's at week 300 was the first release, basically. Um, and, you know, the number of developers shoots through the roof um, because everyone goes, oh, I like that tool, but it doesn't do what I want it to do. And, you know, everyone piles in. So at that, response, at that point, the mean developer engagement actually goes up. So not only is there a lot more developers, the products actually become better at using them. Um, so this is the kind of thing that, as quality evaluators, we can start to think about rather than just code in terms of, am I producing a quality product or not? How do you measure the MDE? So all this is doing is this is a, 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 a Python script that I'm running against uh, a mirror of, of the repository. Do you have one for, for Debian? Uh, I can do, I, I don't have the data for Debian, but I can do it. I mean, the, this, this. I open this to see which, which things in Debian that correlates. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I, I mean, this against, I mean, basically what I do, this is a Perl script which parses, uh, you know, SVN, CVS, or Git log. Okay. So I mean, we don't have such logs. <laughs> yeah. So that's the that's the that's the problem. Um, I can run this this against um, in its current form. I can run this against repositories. Um, so basically, what it does is, I mean, it it takes the not in the XML form, but it takes the plain text SVN log, which for KDE is about 140 meg, and then mm -hmm. passes it. According to the figure, I tried to. Get out yesterday from my ideas. We have like a quarter of the archive on uh, SVM on Ideas. So yeah, we can uh, run against that path that are there. And we could, of course, use the XVCS headers to say, well, we have this many archives that yeah. go on there. So we could make something, but it's not as easy as perhaps with for KDE. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because we can tell us under a good editor. We can do it for some parts. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what's interesting, the reason I, I, mean, I want to actually do a direct comparison between KE and GNOME, um, but you can't actually do that because GNOME doesn't have one repository. It has separate repositories for all the separate parts, whereas KDE has one repository with all the separate parts as, as branches within it, um, which is why Events was done by itself. Um, just to give you an so I, I, I mentioned, just to show you the kind of things that we can find and how to, so if you, I mean, it's all very well being able to flag up and say, okay, I can see now that some things going on here and um, you know, this might have a knock-on effect to the quality of my product. So I mean, here you can see two things. There's this massive leak going on here. The other thing is, I mean, this is asymptotic to a very low level. Um, um, oh, because uh, um, the decreasing amount of the broker can mean uh, to be access to things either uh, the project is aborted in some way or just basically because it's mentioned and Yeah, so uh, all that's fine utils is, I think, very steady and hasn't changed for maybe seven, eight years. Yeah. And someday someone's going to say, okay, we need ACL, uh, we need uh, to introduce some X attribute uh, in it, and suddenly this is going to be. Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the important thing. This, this only works for people who are actively involved with QA within their project. To be able to interpret this properly, you have to know what's going on in your own product. You know, because I'm not involved with events, I had to do a lot of groundwork to work out what was going on, for instance, here, um, and why this is such a low level. Uh, but but if, you, if, this is, if this is an evaluation of your own product, you know what's going on. 
So you can look at this over time and say, oh, this is starting to dip now, what's going wrong? Or, or, or maybe it's dipping and you know why it's dipping, because you know, you know it's become stable and it really doesn't need much more work on it or whatever. As, a, as someone who's evaluating your own product, you, mean, you know what's going on. Um, yes, it's difficult from my perspective, for instance, when I'm trying to evaluate hundreds of projects and I don't necessarily know what's going on, and I, I don't know what's going on. But, I mean, for instance, I mean, it took me a long time to dig what's going on here, but I'll, I'll actually, this is extremely hard to see in the photo, but what, what I've got here is I've visualized what was going on in some version. So what you have reading from left to right is um, columns, where each column is a week of development. And then from top to bottom, you have the developers. And what happens is quite simply, if a developer does something in that week, they get a, a green block to show they did something in that week. And what, what you find is, so between here and then this point here, so this is time running in this direction, between here and here is, is that 300, you know, I showed you before, you know, nothing happened for 300 weeks, okay? That's this here, okay? And the reason that, the reason it gets so low is because for the first, for the first 300 weeks, I've never seen a project so bad at engaging as developers. It takes on about 36 developers in that 300 weeks. And in that period, only one hacker ever committed in any one given week. Yeah, and you, you can really see what this thing is. There's a lot of people coming and just doing one or two commits and then disappear again. Yeah, so this is just, this is just a week. And so for, that's what they had for almost 300 weeks, was, was someone, who, someone who came in, did a, did a week, and then dropped out. And there was never more than one person in any given week. And then basically what happened was this person came in here and they basically maintained it for a long time. But then after, you know, almost a year of development themselves there, they then drop out while someone else comes in for a few weeks. Then they come back for a week. Then the other person comes back. It was almost as if they were just passing maintainership from one to the other when they kind of got bored of it. I thought, oh no, I'll have that back again. That's the exclusive token. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, that's what they did for, for 300 weeks. So as a result, their figure is quite... Low. So despite the fact they had 30, I think it's 34, 36 developers for that 300 weeks, they, they hardly ever, well, they never utilized a lot of them. It wasn't until the first release, which is just, uh, so even here, this is still one developer at a time, but it's around about here, this is week 300, when you start seeing multiple commits by different committers in the same week. But wasn't uh, events maintained inside the uh, GNOME repository? So maybe just people had access or were more so, inclined to do a a small, a small change and... Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, basically what, from looking through the box, what we have a situation is where someone says, oh, I want to make a better graphical wrapper for XPDF. And so they, they, check, it, they check in the libraries for XPDF and a few other things, and then it sort of, you know, they sort of, if you read the commits, it's like, you know, added small feature X, added small feature Y, like, like it was piecemeal for a long time. Um, and it, it remained that way for it was just built up very slowly by one person at a time, basically over 300 weeks. So I don't know the culture of GNOME. I don't know why that was the case. Um, so all I'm suggesting here is, is that someone from the outside of the Vince, I don't know, but to me that that very quick drop followed by sustained inactivity to me it seems like something that as developers they should have been maybe concerned about. Um, Enough for that time being. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push all of this. So I can, so maybe, someone can write or can put it so people can work it. There are plenty of people on the camera, they're not stealing. This one is not stealing, it's only the tapes. The slides will go in the uh, archive along with videos, so. Yeah. Another thing to, to think about, um, which is what some of the other, actually specifically some of the KDE developers are looking at in terms of, so again, just think about, think about things other than code that we can measure, is looking at um, licensing compatibility. Just an example of something else that we can you know, actively measure. Um, a lot of projects have this as a problem in that they've got code which is committed, which says, um, you know, this is GPL v2. And in the same code base, you've got people with the and newer clause, or rather the or newer clause. Uh, and then at the same time, they're having a situation where people send them patches and don't attach a license to the patch. 
and then it's like, okay, do I assume that the patch is for the original, as, the, as you know, the same license as the original file? Do I just turf it? Do I make the effort to go back and ask the patch maker which license they intended this to be in, and stuff like that? And again, this is something if you keep the data, or if the data is already stored somehow, you can measure. And again, we can, you know, we can postulate there's some kind of knock-on effect with the resultant quality. For example, if you are finding in a situation in your day-to-day -day workings, you are having to turn away a lot of code because the patches are unlicensed. Um, you might be putting yourself in a situation where actually if you did chase up uh, whoever wrote the patch to find out which license they intended, then actually your, your rate of development or maintenance or whatever might actually go up. Um, so again, it's just suggestions about you know, things that are outside of you know, the normal sort of sphere of thinking. Um, so basically, any of these kind of these metrics, these things that we can think about and say, yes, this potentially has, this could be part of our quality model that we can measure. Um, if we can write a tool for it, by and large, as long as the output is in some way sanely readable, um, then we can wrap it up and have it as a plug-in to this um, the system that we're developing. So. The system that um, is currently proposed, we're still kind of going into our design phase, but the, the idea is that this will be based on um, a framework called OSGI. Is that, is that something you've come across? OSGI is, 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 is the Open Services Gateway Infrastructure, and it's basically a way of uh, distributing uh, jobs over uh, multiple machines. Uh, so it handles job scheduling and stuff like that, uh, and it's plug-in based. Um, so basically, it's very easy to, to write wrappers for jobs, which then get scheduled. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a standard, it's not an implementation. Um, it's the standard, the, the, I think the best known implementation of it is called Equinox, and that's actually the back end to Eclipse. Um, so if you've ever used Eclipse and have a, have a feel for that, then that's, you know, that's, the, that's the kind of system we're talking about here. Uh, where basically, as I said, as long as we can uh, write tools to evaluate whatever it is we see as important to quality, we can then aggregate the results in some way which we see pertinent, whether you want to give better weight into, for instance, what Linda tells you about your packages as opposed to, you know, what MDE tells you about how, how effective, you know, things are going on upstream in the developer base. Um, that's the kind of system that, that we're, we're planning on building. The idea, hopefully, is that um, in the end, this will be a system which um, uh, developers and uh, hopefully specifically in Debian package maintainers would actually want to use um, in order just to keep a, a running, you know, eagle eye on what quality is to your project, to your package, uh, and how that's changing over time. Um, so that you can adapt accordingly, uh, quite frankly. Uh, the tool you're building, the data must be available, uh, which you just like, which So, um, I, it, it's something I didn't want to, I didn't want to actually want to touch on too much about the workings of the project. I was really sort of focused on the tool, but, but yes is the answer. Um, what's happening is, so we're developing a tool which is free software, so the idea is we want people to have to go out and use it uh, for themselves on their own products. Um, however, because obviously as the developers we've got the head start, um, we are going to build up basically a large database of um, certain metrics um, built up over time. So basically we're going to pick off a lot of low-hanging fruit during the course of the lifetime of the project. So for instance, we'll look at stuff like um, creating databases of things like slot count or WC-L, you know, per revision, per project for you know, any project that people are interested in or rather we're interested in. Um, so there will be a publicly available data source for certain projects if we've run them. Um, however, I mean, the tools free software, you'll be able to go and grab it for yourself uh, and, and run it against whichever projects interest you, whether that's, you know, just your package or whether it's, you know, the upstream version as well or whether it's anything you might be interested in, basically. Uh, but yeah, rudimentary data will be available for certain things because it's, it's, you know, although it's going to take a while to do WC-L for every file and every revision of certain projects, like doing that kind of thing against KDE is going to produce quite a massive table in a database somewhere. Um, but compared to like 
the metrics that I've been talking about here, they're computationally more expensive. So uh, as a project, I'm going to be running them um, against certain projects. But um, for developers, you'll, you know, it'll, it'll take a long time to sort of crunch those numbers. So part of the problem with the finalized system is how long it takes to evaluate quality purely will depend on your quality model. And if you do include things like some of the things I've been talking about, then that might take a long time to compute, depending on what kind of hardware you've got available to you. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like just like a sort of eagle-eye view of what we're doing as a project. The, I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm, I'm giving, like I actually have slides here, I'm giving a presentation followed by a BOF at Academy, and I'm doing the same at Wardek. And basically, as a project, we have three questions which we want to pose to uh, developers at each one to get kind of feedback as to, um, you know, are we going in the right direction with this project? Um, so I'm hoping those will now form the basis of sort of discussion from now on. So um, uh, the first question is simply what what are you guys interested in when you talk about quality? So you know, when you look at your packages, you might say, okay, well, we've got the Debian guidelines for package maintenance. We've got Linda. We've got Lynchon, we've got all these other Perl scripts which do nice things. In terms, of, in terms of your product quality, and again, I mean either Debian or just your packages, how far do you go? What, what is quality to you in terms of the product? So speaking as a user, and then leave the more developer answer to people like Andy, which probably doesn't do it a lot. I think the response time to bug reports is really relevant. Sure. Because uh, you can have a wonderful software product which has a, a really bad Debian package and same the contrary, just because the, the maintainer of the package is like your front end to the quality of the package. So if I send a bug report, I would like to see an hack back. If I send a patch, I would like to see if applied or not, but with an answer. If I send like an upstream patch, I would like it to see for what an upstream and so on. Bug reports are actually a really good one because they're, they're again something which can tell you something about quality, but it's not necessarily something you might think of. Like the number, the, I don't know, the average lifetime of a bug report within your bug tracking system might, so you, you'd hope that you have many bug reports which have a short lifetime and maybe a few that have a long lifetime. Well, what is the, the lifetime? I don't think it's that relevant. I think it's more relevant the responsiveness. Uh, well, in, in the amount of time till the bug is at the appropriate level. So if somebody files a bug report, say it's a novel bug, something doesn't work, and then the first time until someone qualified, look at it and say, well, but actually it's a vicious, so actually that is a least critical bug or whatever. So okay. until that time. So, yeah, so, 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 yeah. yeah, so as a user, response time is important, but as a developer, yeah. Knowing, knowing how long bugs are around for. And actually, if, if, if a developer then says, well, what you said is actually a vicious bug, and if somebody writes a patch, after writes a patch, I will have it included, then I would say from our point of quality view, the bug is handled correctly. Sure. So that yeah, but even you can have a really nasty bug, which is not that important, so it can have yeah, a long life cycle, but you, you see progress. I, I, it depends on the nature. I mean, for me, if a bug's nasty, uh, it depends on if it's nasty, I want to make sure it has a short lifetime yeah. as possible. So, nasty, I mean, like, hard to, hard, hard to fix. Hard, hard to track, hard, hard, okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, hard to fix or done. Okay. The point's really interesting because it, it's, the, it's the point that the project takes to become conscious of the bug report and to look at it and to make a decision on what to do with it. Yes. And for example, I have seen cases where some of the products that a package is not working at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but he reported with normal severity, nobody looked at it, and something like one year later, another person reported it as a C bug, and then the community fixed the package within something like two weeks. Yeah, I mean, it's it really interesting for me to, to look at what goes on with Debian QA list. And I can for, show you know, some bug statistics of mine. Yeah. That's the number, most people all know that, that's the number of C bugs. Sure. So, what, is, what you can see happening here is basically the release of Edge, uh, and the, at this point, you see the release of Edge happening, and the bugs now explode afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Which just means that the people who were fixing lots of SC bugs before don't do it, and then a couple of SC bugs we just ignored for Edge reasons. 
Um, but we said, well, it's bad, but it's not so bad to need to the lay edge, which then at this point where the slush like up is, we touch uh, the move to ignore it from the square. <laughs> so that's why the bug was exploded, sir. And all the new upstream versions which go so yeah, but that's just something we are already measuring and taking for quality. What we don't measure is what you said is that until the initial response from the community, which we could perhaps now track a bit better because we can now ask the version that is how old is the bug and when was the last written to. And if it's not the, if it's the same for more than four weeks, then we might put it on a list to yeah. evaluate. Yeah. So it's it's nice. So we are doing because because I've got this data in the BTS memory files, you have to pass the, the main box in the BTS. So yeah, you can just say, I would want to see any box where it's are, uh, are the same day in which all of them two weeks. That should be fairly easy to ask to implement on the normal pack package supports. Which do? The normal pack, if you just ask, where Donna has just shown, that you can say when was the Spark class modified and when was the Spark created. Yes. You can just compare and say if, if they are the same, and the bug is all less than two weeks, I want to see the bugs. So you could just do QA on that. Unworth bugs. That would be a cool thing actually. Yeah. So another interesting point to measure, which I've uh, observed, I think, as a common uh, factor in a lot of QA effort, is uh, look at how much a package adheres to standard practices. <coughs> like if if we introduce uh, something new in the policy, or if you introduce uh, a new method for handling a package, I consider a good package uh, one which is up to date with these practices. So I think a lot of Q&A effort, uh, like all which harvest the package and do checks on them uh, automatically, can be identified as something which looks if uh, a best practice is used in a package. So in that sense, you have to hope that whoever's maintaining Mind or Lynchin is actually updating those tools to yeah. meet measurements of the new guidelines. So, for example, a package which is using developer, if I look at the source and I see that the developer compatibility level is two, I start feeling, okay, this package is not really it's updated. updated. It's and it's unmaintained, unmaintained, basically. Yeah. yeah. So that's just an example. That one. You know, if you have a new technology for dealing with packages, and if something is not up to date with respect to that something might be wrong. Yes, that's, that's, that's a very uh, thing because actually there are a few sides of it. So if I usually do bug slide, I'm, if I see a package was well maintained, I, I don't any view it so far. But I see, oh, the package was, it's not really maintained, but it's maintained anyways, I will just be quite fast when I'm viewing it. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, I, I can't, actually, I don't think I know what criteria I apply to, but there are some. Yes, definitely. Early on, when I when I mentioned thinking about Debian as a whole rather than necessarily individual packages, one one of the reasons I, I brought that up was I mean earlier on Debian QA there was a there was an email to say hey no one seems to have maintained this package in you know x number of months but in that time the upstream version has changed you know y number of times would uh, having the system be able to report on um, activity within packages uh, communally? be something that's maybe useful to the project as a whole. Like detecting when a maintainer looks like they're dropping out. Yeah, we are before it. But actually there's a problem is how would you detect that a maintainer is dropping out? Okay. Um, actually what happens is if we see some well, most bugs are not supported by users, but by people it, I would say first inside the Debian community. Yeah. So for example what I've now done is yesterday I've collected a C bugs and say well this package needs to go out of test because it's too broken. What I usually do then is, I look at the developer and say, oh, and this developer didn't upload for one year. So that's, that's a special alias that's a behalf in Debian for the missing action team handlers. So I write a mail and say, well, these people in that, that this package I have just removed and all of them look MAA to me. And so another team picks it up and now as they have pings the maintenance says, what's your state? I was intending to continue working on Debian and if the maintainers don't answer, their packages are forced are taken away from them, and somebody else can take them over, or if nobody does it, they will, they will be removed. So it happens, but in some cases it doesn't happen perhaps fast enough. But on the other hand, when would you say a maintainer is dropping out? If you didn't do an upload for three months, that could be totally okay. Especially if, if he has packages uh, which don't need so often care. 
which is the point. Figures, figures are so different according to the metric of the product. The text, so exactly. Yeah. It's the same point you made earlier. It's the maturity of the product. You expect to slow down. Yeah. Right. No new readings, no blowbacks. Well, I have had in package to any group is best college. Yes, please. Well, actually, I have, I have had in package yes. which I upload, up, which I uploaded only once during this extra new cycle. And, and that's just only because I have a new compiled, because I thought it's better for quality to don't yeah. use exactly the same version as a search. So, would you say that package was unintended? Didn't hit any bugs either? So, yeah. And again, actually, that that's also the kind of things that you can measure over time. So as as something is in development, um, yes. you could you can look at the upstream version of something that you're developing and, and, and look at say okay how much of this is maintenance and how much of this is actually you know new features how much you know yeah. um, because as as maintainers this is important for you probably in terms of ensuring that it actually works with the rest of Debian um, in terms of uh, ensuring successful integration um, so maintenance. Uh, upstream maintenance and upstream, upstream like new or changing of features um, have different ramifications for you as you know as package maintainers, um, which is also something that might be the kind of thing that you'd be interested in tracking. Right? And the measure is of course the, the gap between uh, Debian version and upstream version, but I think that should be like weighted with respect to. Other, what other distribution do? I mean, there might be a justified gap if an upstream version sucks, so it's experimental or mm. something, but if other distribution like our true version ahead of what we have in Debian, that might be an indication of something is wrong. Yeah, that's, we should also like look at what other distribution are doing with that certain package, because if some distribution is I was updating a package and now the distribution updates it. Is that yeah, that's basically what that sounds weird or, or backwards. Are you specifically then talking about say uh, other dev based distributions or RPM based ones? So maybe we can try to look at all of them. Well, if, I think if, it doesn't if matter. Look at upstream versions, it doesn't it doesn't matter at yeah. all. Yeah. Well it might matter it, it might, might matter in some, there might be some exceptional cases. Where well, other distributions don't really care about issues like copyright or so. We have we have some exceptional packages which just, but that means of course from the QA perspective, the packages maintain bad anyways. Not by us, but by upstream. But yeah, I was thinking of Firefox, where it took quite a time to get uh, released to Yeah, and you know, it's quite a nice issue. Yeah, but of course, end of these cases means the package is of bad quality. Perhaps not the debit part of it. <laughs> okay. Um, the next uh, question is a project we were looking to. Sorry. Well, maybe I just finish. I want to. Um, when I want to pick a, 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 a so this software I'm looking for, um, most of the aspects were already raised. But there's one thing is as uh, adoption. Of a, package, of a given package, uh, usually, um, if a product if a product is widely adopted, uh, we can assume the quality is higher, which is not so exactly popular. So you mean looking at using popular? Yeah, so we think that's really right. And this is and this uh, and popular is very useful, but. Uh, and does, sometimes does, it's even six years because yeah, it's a priority. Yeah, yeah. Does, does PopCon do waiting? Like, I mean, everything that's in Debian base, you know, you expect to have extremely high popularity because it gets installed whether you want to or not. I mean, does, does PopCon take that into account? Does it give, does it, 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 it? Yes, it does. And that's something I found some, um, that's what I was about to say. It's tricky. It's sometimes uh, a package which is supposed to be mainstream, uh, if it happens to be. Uh, removed by many people, uh, it's, in, it's it's a real sign of maybe this product lacks major features or something like that because many people choose not to uh, to use this software but use this one instead. Yeah. So they remove yeah. from the mainstream. Yeah. So instead of being having eighteen thousand, I think that's, it's a coin count. Uh, it's only uh, seventeen thousand, and a thousand people choose another one. Maybe it means that. 
the other one has real quality um, to be taken into account. Well, it's actually, I mean, you, you, you've hit one of my favorite points on the head. I mean, when, when you get a chance to see the slides, the first point I make is when, when free software products are competing for, you know, users and developers or, or other contributors, um, I mean, the thing that really does that ultimately end up, you know, splitting them is quality, you know. People, you know, the way I see it is people either be attracted to a project because they think it's good quality and they want to contribute, or they might think, you know, this is something I want to contribute because it needs help. So either way, quality is important in there. I'm, I'm glad you might, we've, we've come into popularity contest because this is kind of the next big question is, okay, so this kind of system where we can um, plug and play whatever metrics are important to us as developers, uh, and specifically within Debian, um, is there a specific, a Debian specific role that you could see a system like this doing? Uh, the, the example is, are any of you actually on the Debian QA list? Okay, so I, the suggestion I, I published to the QA list was, okay, package maintainers could um, use the system with whatever plugins they choose as part of their quality, you know, maybe one's a wrapper for Linda as well, um, which just says, okay, how does my quality compare with the upstream, up, upstream quality? Am I actually improving the product by, by putting it into Debian? Am I doing something which is maybe, you know, maybe it's, it's not working so well by package maintainers? So, I mean, there's a suggestion. The other thing is, as part of that, you may then say, well, as part of my quality model, you know, what's the popularity of my package? Which may have, you know, that may form part of your individual quality model for your package. So, I mean, the, the question now is, so, is, is there a potential Debian-specific role for this type of system? Are you aware of uh, more project? Uh, just, uh, Mr. Rowland, that a piece of software called Mole. Uh, called Mole? Mole, it demonstrates the first step of the year. He's been collecting lots of information on packages and uh, building an accessible database okay. um, for statistics like you know, the uh, lints, yeah. um, number of bugs and so on, and so all this stuff. I think the structure, because a lot of information is fairly loose, there's certain things that's combined in certain ways, but it's, it's a useful data repository for loose of things. I don't know how active that's continuing, uh, but it did look interesting at the time. So, I mean, if that's, so if, that, if that's a publicly available data source, and that's the kind of thing where if there's a people, people could write... It would be very interesting to look at, just, you know, so you can then make more statements about Debian yourselves yeah. and go off and do that, that would be... Yeah, and as a public data source, it's something where, as developers, you can write tools which access that data source to become part of your individual quality models, which, like in this scenario, could then be an, a, you know, or multiple plugins to whatever your quality model is. Um, is this the kind of thing, like, as package maintainers, um, what are, I mean, what are your, your individual practices? Do they, do they vary widely? From package to package? Well, I think for that issue that I looked look at our chat with uh, Matt Graf, which is basically doing a PhD thesis on this. I, I've worked with him in the past. So, yeah. Yeah. he's precisely researching how like, new technology or, or new practices spread in the global community. I mean, the reason, the reason I asked the question is because that will have a spread of practices, I mean, a, across free software as a whole, let alone just within Debian will have ramifications on how many plugins we need to run, whether they run concurrently, how computationally expensive they are, how long, just how long they take. Um, that's, that was really my motivation for asking the question. I mean, if something is computationally hard, it's obviously not the kind of thing that people are really thinking of doing by hand. Yeah. Uh, and so... So, anyhow, back to your previous question, which is not that I'm to me, but I think it would be very interesting to look at how many patches are applied in a Debian packages with respect to an upstream package. Of course, you should exclude the patches which are specific of Debian packaging, but that's not quite easy because a lot of packages are maintained with tools like dpatching, which you separate the patches with regard to the upstream product and the patches needed by Debian. And uh, not only the number, because it might not be really significant, but also, how many patches flows flow upstream? Mm -hmm. Like I'm maintaining Vim, right. we have like tens on tens of pack of patches. But just before the upstream release of Boom, we usually ping the upstream, and almost all of them flow 
and will be integrated in the next, next package or in the, mm. sorry in the next version of Vim. But I think that's a clear example where Debian packaging is improving the software quality. Sure. <coughs> I think you should also have a look at the both, but you probably are aware of that, named the supporting 15,000 packages. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I'm conscious of the fact we're sort of running towards the end of the actual hour. Um, are there other sort of Debian specific quality issues with where you can see a system like the one being proposed would help you either project as a whole or as individual maintainers? You, is there anything specifically where you see this is the kind of thing this this could help me in some specific way? I mean, ultimately, what we're trying to do in this project is build a tool, build a system that people will actually want to use. Now, we're very conscious of the fact that KDE is actually a partner of the project. What we don't want to end up doing is building a tool which is only useful in KDE. <laughs> Actually, what would be useful to get the tool implemented in Debian would be, well, of course, speaking about the most thing, what you said, what, what, what Luke, uh, Lucas said before, and the other one was, was, would be to get the output of the, or at least get some indications on the package tracking system. Because it's a, we have a, a page on the web for our package tracking system, that's the main page I look for. If I, if I look at a package and say, well, What's the quality of the package I look there? Because you see, when was the package last uploaded? Or which was the last upload? So I can see, oh, five and used by five different people, and the last maintained upload was in 2001. So I know what this package is. Sure. So I see, oh, yeah, a lot of maintenance uploads, and sometimes a new in between. I say, okay, that's something else. Okay. So um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I will actually just wrap up just now. I mean, my thoughts, I mean, what I've got back from this is, um, We've, we've now talked about, okay, there's the potential to look at upstream versus package quality, popularity contest, the stuff that comes up mole. Um, these could all be potential plugins for one overall quality model, which this final system could then compute for you on a, you know, as, a, as in effect part of a you know, continuous integration, if needs be. Well, actually, from my point of view, how should I say, um, well, of course, we, we in Debian use statistics a lot because you can't handle so many packages, so many bugs otherwise if you don't use such methods. Yeah. But um, what I'm happy about is that currently in Debian we don't have, or we have the approach to say we have pages where we just put on a lot of uh, statistics of different parts and then let the developers themselves make the final call, which is a thing I like quite much. And basically, the package tracking system is just that. It displays a different version, different things. It displays potential issues detected. It did, so I think that would be an, it would be good to, to have your output there to see, uh, yeah, what's uh, what's what's going on quality-wise related to upstream, or there is an upstream version. It could also, for example, be something that could be just as is on the package tracking system. Um. I, I've got one last question, which is kind of um, a little bit out there, um, but it's in terms of where I'm going to take my work a bit further. Um, do you believe there could be a relationship between the web of trust and the quality of data? Um, the problem with the web of trust is that it's raised by case and parties where everybody signs everybody's keys and. It's not like uh, I, Do you have dates when the, the keys are actually signed? Yeah. Yeah. So you can identify which ones are key signed parties and which ones are private mm -hmm. signings. So you would probably get relationships and you'd also find through the co yeah. Actually, you said there are some relationships because I have identified when I look at missing and extra maintainers, there are some people who just appear a bit and disappear. So these people often have only one or two signatures. So uh, I doubt that there's a difference between someone who has 10 signatures or, or 100 signatures. So it's only about if somebody believes in key, key signing parts or not. But if somebody has two signatures or 10, that makes a large difference. Yeah, I think if you did calculate with key signing parts, you would probably think we'll address the data in that kind of form. 
First of all, when you sign a key, you just sign that you trust that people to be who we said to be. So it's not really a quality trust. It shows that you can meet other people or not. It, it just shows you do you meet other people in that year? Yeah. But honestly, you, you can have no. But the, the reason the reason I asked was because okay, so, so you have to have met a person and they have to have identified themselves to you. So it's a good way of measuring how often and what the quality of meetings are on a project. Yeah, so not, not so, so, so it's, it, it might measure the quality of meetings. Uh, I agree on that. But I mean, you can have a wonderful contributor which like have basically never met other mm, fellow yeah. developer in there. Yeah. 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 Actually, of course, what you say is very, very so independent of, as it's true for all measure, kind of measurements. So measurements only give a rough estimate. Uh, I'll give you a pile of my work, but I, or what I do is, Basically, if you have 10 IC bugs on Debian, it doesn't say uh, we can release in one week. It just says there are 10 issues. And if there are 10 easy issues, then it might be that 10 bad, bad issues that are far worse than 80 easy ones. And that's a, in the end a call of the developer. So it might give indications, but it doesn't make an authoritative answer about if it's good or bad quality. And that's something we always need to keep in our mind if we speak about numbers and measurements. They give good indications, but they're not the final answer. Yes. If you're looking at doing a social structure map as well, there's an old project which may be interesting, a different angle, but you're saying before the mailing lists and mm -hmm. you're tracking things in the mailing list. There was a, a person from Maryland who did a talk at Europython last year, which was really interesting what they were doing. They'd taken uh, discussions on the Python mailing lists and they'd mapped them out in a really interesting form and seen what the resolutions of these were. Mm -hmm. So they could actually track what sort of discussions lead to progress, what sort of discussions lead to you no know, problems happening in the project and so on. And they were doing quite interesting analysis on that. That could be quite a good thing to feed in as well. So you could be a good discussion was who's specifically who's responding to who on a repeated basis and how that actually reflects quality if you want to take it Yeah. And these are and I mean actually these are all things which are they might not seem that like they relate to each other, and they might not seem like they have an effect on quality, which is why I left Web of Trust to the end. Um, but they're all potentials. These are all things which we can look at and, in conjunction, build a quality model around them and, and say. The, the reason I particularly want to bring up Web of Trust to the end is because it's something that is actually so kind of important, especially in the Debian world, that it's hard to kind of ignore it and say that it might not have some kind of effect on quality, which is why. And it's a number attached to a whole sort of blue thing. It's, it's well, right? uh, yeah. yeah. It's a okay. Uh, thanks very much. I, um, if you've got keyboards at the ready or pen and paper, I'll give you the URL which I'll post the slides to. Well, you can write it on the conference classroom. Actually, yeah, I'll I'll do that and I'll post it on uh, Debian QA as well for those of you who are okay. who are there. Um, and. Um, yeah, if there's anything more discussion-wise, um, Debian QA is probably the place, or feel free to just drop me a private email. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make another URL as well. Thanks very much. <laughs>